Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to you guys that are online watching. I'm really glad to be here with you this morning, but I got a terrible head cold and chest cold, right? So we're going to do the best I can uh, to deliver the message that God planted in my heart a week ago, okay? And so we're going to continue in our series, the Advent series that we're in, where we're reaccounting the Christmas story. And in here, we're looking at the five questions that arise from our story that will determine our destiny, just like it did in the characters of the story, right? The first two, Pastor Andy talked about these past couple of weeks. The first one, will I accept God's destiny for me? And we saw how Mary arose and she said yes, even though it was an unexpected purpose in her life. And she accepted that. And then we watched uh, last week the question, how uh, will I obey God when things don't go my way? And we saw Joseph pull within himself and dare to believe in God and follow him when nothing made sense to him. And so today I want to talk to you about how will I and how will you find God's peace and joy for our lives. I want us to look at that. And the part of the Christmas story I'm going to look at <clears throat> today will be how the angels come and they uh, announce to the shepherds and then what the shepherds did with that message that they received and how that changed their lives, right? How it ushered peace in. And so that's what we're going to look at today. You know, in my, in my job that I've been doing for many, many years, I've had this privilege of meeting many different kinds of people, right? All kinds of people. I've, I've met people that are what I consider simple, just straightforward people, then people that are very complex, right? And I've met people that are quite wealthy and those that are in poverty. I've met people that are type A, go-getter, busy, running 100 miles an hour, and I've met people that are, you know, relaxed or they're retired and they kind of watch the butterflies go by, right? So I've met all kinds of people out there. But you know, I rarely meet people that are full of peace. I rarely meet people that are totally peaceful with themselves and with other people, right? that they don't have that peace, they don't walk in it. It's almost like the rhythm of their life is that they're unable to access that. And so today, it's been in my heart to come and to talk to you about how we can have this rhythm set forth in our lives that I believe the Christmas story tells us about, where we can truly have peace with God. We can truly have peace inside of us and peace with people. Bow your heads with me. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come even more. Holy Spirit, I thank you. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for uh, what you're doing here now. And Father, I thank you that you use the weak things to bring forth your truth. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come in every nook and cranny, Lord, that you would be Lord over it, that you would usher in your Holy Spirit. And uh, I just bind all things that are not of you in the name of Jesus. And I release you, Father, to move. For we need a word from you. We are desperate for you. That's what brought us in here this morning, Lord. And so, Holy Spirit, would you deposit, I hear that, would you remove any distractions so that we can be attentive to your word, to hear what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, um, on your outline, if you pull that out, I want to talk to you about a couple of scriptures. You know, 700 years before the birth of Christ, we have this prophet, Isaiah, that comes on and he gives us this prophecy pronouncing what's going to be happen. And uh, it's in Isaiah 9, 6. It's on your outline. For a child will be born to us, a son is given to us, and he will be named, one of the names is the Prince of Peace. And so Isaiah is saying, hey, the Prince of Peace is coming your way. And this is 700 years before Christ was born. And at the time of Christ's birth, right, we see that uh, the angels proclaim the same Prince of Peace that has come. In Luke 2, 8 through 14, it says this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified, <laughs> right? But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause you great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior will be born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly beings or hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. And so in that accounting of the Christmas story we're reading, we see this interchange that's happening 
with the angels, and they're coming, they're talking to the shepherds, and they're saying, hey, wake up, because the promise of the king of peace is coming. It's coming to each and every one of you. The fulfillment is happening, right? And this is going to activate their faith, and this is what we're looking for, that each and every one of us needs to take the message that we see in the baby Jesus over there. What was the significance of his life, right? He is going to bring us peace, and we need to understand that. And I think at Christmas time, it's a great time to actually take that out and to look at it and say, what kind of peace did he bring us, right? And how do we have access to this peace? And to make that understandable, because you see, how you answer this question will determine the peace that you walk through this life with and then what happens to you eternally. And so we need to have the answer for this. Now, I don't know all of you that come in today. I don't, certainly don't know a lot about your life and we're closing out a decade. And for some of you, it might have been pretty good. And I think a lot of you, though, you're like, whew, thank goodness that's done, right? And you come in, and you might be a little stressed or fatigued or tired, right? And some of you might go, it's okay, I got through it. No matter where you are on the spectrum, and if it was a fantastic year, we all need to grow in peace. How do I know that? Because when I open up the scriptures and I look at the scriptures, I see there are 790 verses that deal with peace. That's a whole lot of verses, right? And so our Father, I believe, knows that we need that. We need that in here. And so that's why he gave it to us. And when I took those 790 verses and I put them in categories, what I saw is there were verses that talked about the spiritual peace of God. And then I saw there were uh, verses that talked about what I would call the emotional peace. And then the last one, the relational. And that's what I want to talk to you first. These are the type of peace uh, offerings that God has brought to us through his, through his son, Jesus Christ. So on your outline, three kinds of peace Jesus offers you. The first one is peace with God. That's the first one. He brings you peace with God, right? This is a spiritual peace that we talk about. And I'm telling you, this affects everything. So this is really the most important one that you grab hold of and that you, you hold on to, right? You see, I know that when you're in a relationship, any relationship, if it goes out of whack, you know, like a husband and wife, when you go out of whack, right, or a boyfriend girlfriend, when you get there, nothing else matters, right? Nothing else matters. It's strain and it's hard and it's you know, when that conflict arises and all peace and joy goes. Well, let me tell you, it's the same with God. When we're out of whack with God, right, everything goes wrong, and it's intensified a thousand times more, and it just permeates every part of your life. And so it's important, right, that we get in sync with God because God doesn't want us to be far from him. God doesn't want that. Matter of fact, Jesus Christ came and was born in the manger because he was going to offer mankind peace to holy God. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5.18. It says, God sent Christ to make peace between himself and us. You can cross out that us and put me, put your name in it, right? So that's why Christ came. Well, why do we need that, Sharon? Why do we need that? Because you and I have this propensity to think we know what's best for our life. It's our life after our darn it, right? And so we're going we're gonna to do what we want to. We write what we want to, the guidelines for how we're going to live. We do our own thing. And if God tells us to go one way and we don't feel like that's the best, we tend to turn away and do our own thing. And yet, when I read the Word of God, do you know what that says about that behavior that I have and that you have? It's called rebellion. It's called rebellion. And it separates us. It brings us in conflict with God. And, and when we're in conflict with God, there is no peace. There's no peace. And so we need to know that God wants us to have peace. You see, when we get in conflict, we get disconnected and we, we pull away. And it feels like God is a million miles away, doesn't it? But God doesn't want that. He wants to bring us in because he loves us. We were designed to be connected with him. Romans 5.1 says, Since we are made right with God by faith in Christ, we have peace with God because of what? Jesus has done for us. He's done for me, and he's done for you. And so what I want you to see here is that God made up the, he's the one who's given us the peace. I can't be kind enough to have peace with God. I can't be good enough to have peace with God. The only way that we have peace with God is if we come through the one and only way, which is through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you are able to achieve peace with God. And so that's the first thing that Jesus offers us when he comes to earth is to be able to have peace with our God. The second thing he offers us is peace within ourselves, with peace within me, 
right, within you. And we refer to this, I refer to this as the peace of God. This is the peace of God here, right? This is where, you know, we're, we're walking in step with God, and this is the kind of peace that's inside of us that makes us feel like we're right, makes us feel like we're good, right? In Colossians 3.15, it says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Circle that word, in. It's very important because we're talking about what's going on inside now. We're talking about internally what's happening to you. You could say it's an, an emotional type that we're talking about here, right? You know, when I read the Bible, the Bible talks about peace, and it uses the, the uh, Hebrew word shalom. Shalom, which is peace. And it doesn't just mean the absence of hostility, right? It's talking about the totality of a person. It talks about their, you know, their heart, their well-being, their happiness. And so God wants us to have shalom. He wants us to be able to walk in peace. He gives us these 700, you know, and 90 verses. Why? Because he knows we're a complex people. He knows that we get into trouble and we have issues. And when we come upon them, he says, I can overcome them. I will give you the scriptures. I will give you the peace that you lack today. That's what he says. And so if you came in here and you have a broken heart, I want to tell you that God wants to give you the comforting peace today. If you came in and, and you have a confused heart, well, God has scriptures he wants to give you guiding peace, right? And if you came in here with a shameful heart because you know where you've been, God says he wants to give you a forgiving heart. He wants to give you these promises where it can upright you, where you've lost your way since I want to help you find your way. And so he has so many more scriptures than I have time to, to, to give to you today. But they're all in the word of God. If you open them up, if you search them with your whole heart, you will find them. And he has a scripture for every issue, every difficulty that you face in life. He's got a scripture for you. So in the margin, you can put, God has a peace for every problem I have. God has a peace to offer you for every problem you have. Now, God doesn't want you to worry about anything. So God's going to give you this peace, the second category, which is peace, the peace of God inside of you. And next, he gives us the peace with others. He gives us the peace with others. This is external peace, isn't it? This is relational peace. That's what he's talking about here. See, the fact is, the further away we get from God right? The further away we get from God, we get all messed up inside. And you know what happens when we're messed up inside? It spills over into our relationships, right? I mean, when I'm far from God, I'm not a very nice person. <laughs> I don't seem to have as much grace for people that I should have, right? I mean, in reality, if we just look around our world, it is not more peaceful. It is more conflicted than it's ever been. Look what happened this week in Washington, right? Or think about the shootings that just went on down in Florida. Or the racism that seems to exist all around us. You see these things, they're plights. And sometimes I wonder in my soul, I wonder, Lord, how can we have unity in America? Better yet, Lord, how can I have unity within my church? When there are so many different types of people. Well, guys, there's only one way that we can have unity. And here it is in Ephesians 2.16. It says, Christ brought us all together through his death on the cross. The cross gets us to embrace each other and end the hostility between different groups. And so what you see here is that it's in our relationship, it's in our leadership that when we follow Jesus' leadership that we are able to function in unity. We can function as one. Why? Because we all have the same foundation we might not all express it the same, but we have the same foundation in Christ. And when you start to read Christ's words, when you start to hear him, he always talks about how people are more important than issues. He says that you and I are to love people, to honor people, to respect people, and to lift them up, and not to be focused on, is my issue the right issue? And I've got to jam it down people's throats. No, he says to love people, to, to approach them in humility, right? And so you and I are called to love people, and we can only do that with Jesus Christ. So you see the baby in the manger when he came, and the angels proclaimed that he had peace to offer us. It's peace with God. It's peace of God inside of us, and it's peace for mankind, for how we deal relationally with one another. So now we know what kind of peace. What do we do with that? How do we activate that in our lives? You see, I'm so stinking practical. <laughs> I want to know. I want to know, how, how am I supposed to act now? Well, this is what the next part of our sermon and our talk is all about. 
Three essentials to enjoy God's peace. I want to talk to you. I'm going to get real practical about how you can do this. The first one is I must experience a moment of clarity. I must experience a moment of clarity. What is clarity? What, what is this, Sharon? Well, I'm talking about having an experience that's a life-changing, a world-altering experience in your life where your mind is transformed, right? Where you forever will change the way you see things. You begin to see things differently. You don't seem like you did, you know, like you were taught. But, yeah, like you were taught when a child. God says he wants to give you a, a point of clarity here where you go, oh, aha, I get it, right? See, God wants us to have a moment of clarity about who God is, who he really is. And then in light of that, who are we? Not who we think we are, but who are we truly, right? And then God says, then I want to open your eyes to be able to see the people around you and to love them and to work with them, as I say. He's talking about having a different lens, isn't he? He's talking about letting the scales that cover our eyes just fall off so that we can really see what is about us. And you know, without this moment of clarity, nothing changes. Without a moment of clarity, nothing in your life will change. You have to have this moment of clarity. In our story, when I recount with the, with the angels talking to the shepherds, the shepherds actually had a moment of clarity. But that moment of clarity didn't come when the angel came to talk to them. You would think so, because it terrified them, right? But it didn't. The moment of clarity came when they dared to believe what the angel said, and they went to Bethlehem, and they found the baby Jesus lying in a manger. You see, when they saw that, the fulfillment of the promise, that was their moment of clarity. They got it, that their life would never be the same and they would forever be changed. My friends, God wants you to have a, have a moment of clarity where your life will never, ever be the same. You will change. You will change your behaviors, the way you react. And we all need to have this moment of clarity in our lives. Even the Apostle Paul cries out for this in Ephesians 1.18. He says, I pray that your heart will be flooded with light, the moment of clarity, flooded with light, so that you can see something of the future that God has called you to share. And so this, this light that floods in, I want to tell you, though, that you can't have a moment of clarity unless God brings it, unless the Holy Spirit, which is God's promise that it will indwell us, right? Unless the Holy Spirit comes, we can't have those moments of clarity because we're like in a little box and you can't kind of get out of that box. And you need the Holy Spirit to breathe on you so that you can have this moment of clarity. It's kind of like trying to find, I see that, trying to find your purpose in life. You can't find it by yourself. You just can't because you didn't create you. God created you. And so you need God to help you to open up your understanding. You need light to flood into where you are. You need his presence. That's why I always start my, my sermons and my time with you saying, come Holy Spirit. You see, it's with the come Holy Spirit that we're, we're not saying that you're not here. I'm saying, come more. Open these blind eyes that I might see you. Open my heart that I might feel you, Lord. Right? And so we're looking for God to move to give us those points of clarity. And I'm going to tell you that you might have came in here today because it's Christmas and somebody asked you to come, right? There might be a variety of reasons you came today, but I'm going to tell you, the Lord brought you in here today because he intends to give you moments of clarity, especially if you are uh, in rebellion against him. If you're far from him, you see, that's unacceptable that he loves you. And so he wants to give you a moment of clarity where the peace of God can be on you, that you can be at peace with God. And I'm going to give you that opportunity to pray with me at the end of this time that I have with you. And my friends, that's why God brought you here. He wants you to line up and to be at peace with him. The second essential to enjoying God's presence and his peace is I must express an attitude of humility. An attitude of humility. Humility, it's the pathway to peace. Humility is the pathway to peace. Pride, well, pride is the pathway to conflict. That's what that is. And so whenever we see conflict going on around us, just know that somebody's pride just got in the way, right? That their ego just rose up and they got in the way, and that's why there's conflict. And this is true. It's true in your home. It's true in your work, with your friendships. It's even true in this church, right? Whenever conflict arises, it's because pride has taken over. 
And I know that if we reject pride, if we reject that and we go towards humility, look what God says in James 4, 6. God opposes the prideful, but gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to us, guys. That's what he does. And I, you know, I was thinking about this, and I can tell you, I have been God's friend for 42 years. I've been walking with him for 42 years, and I've learned a thing or two. And one of the things I've learned is, God, he's not moved by my whining. <laughs> he's not moved by my complaining or my griping. But, oh, God moves when I am humble, when I realize it has nothing to do with me, that I am not God, that he is the only one that's God, and, and we go towards him. And when we do that, that creates a pathway. That humble uh, attitude creates a pathway for us to get the help that we need through our Savior. And so we need to do that. And I know, again, coming to the end of this decade, right? We're coming to the end that some of you are like barely hanging on and you're wondering, what is the next 10 years going to bring? You know, what is 2020 going to bring to me? And then there's some of you, I'm very well aware, that it's Christmas time, but you feel anything but happiness. Matter of fact, I've been praying for you guys because I've felt this all week long, that there's some of you that you're facing this Christmas and, and you, you're, you're struggling. And, and it might be because you lost somebody you loved. <laughs> yeah, that's part of it. And it might be because, that, because your dreams that you had that you thought you were going to, all of a sudden they're dissipating. Or the thing that you love most in your family is deteriorating, right? And so you're looking at it and you want, you're anything but peace, uh, peaceful. And you're wondering, what is this year going to bring? What is this Christmas going to bring? Can I just get it done? Can I just check it off? Bang, the lights are up. Bang, the tree's done. The presents are wrapped. <laughs> Stop. God wants to, for you to be able to know that right in the midst, you don't have to be busy. Oh, gosh, this is a word. You do not have to be busy. You do not have to be busy. So the Father says that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to give you this peace inside of you that you don't have to be. You can sit. It's okay if you sit and cry. God said, just sit with him and let the peace of God overcome you, for he is in that place of difficulty that you're in right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Now, the Bible says that he understands that we have a, a way about us that we want to, that we side in with pride and, and being, especially in America, that we'll pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and stuff. So he wants to teach us about what does it mean to be humble. And in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it says this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Pray about everything. Don't worry. So I see what I see here is two alternatives. You can either pray, right, or you can be worried. You can either trust in yourself or you can trust in God. You know, and one leads to peace and the other one leads to panic. The other one leads to stress and a lack of peace. But you get to choose. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Tell him what you need. And thank him for all that he has done. So this is how we are, we're going to activate this thing. We're going to start to uh, activate his peace. Because it goes right into then, if we do that, then you will experience God's peace. That's how you get it. Which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard, look at that, it guards your heart and your mind in the living Jesus Christ. And so what we see here is that God wants to give us this peace. He wants to come in and he wants to fill us up. And, it, and the peace he wants to give us goes beyond our wildest imagination. We can't understand it, but he wants to fill us up with this. But he says you got to choose to pray. you got to choose to talk to him. That's what you got to choose to do. And then that leads me into this last point here. To enjoy God's presence, I must expect Jesus to help me. i got to expect that Jesus is going to help me. We have to choose it, right? And this is our faith factor now. It kicks in when we do this, when we expect God to come and help us. Now, I could sum up all of Christmas by saying this, that when Jesus Christ, born as a baby, comes in, he comes in with the angels pronouncing this. He has come to give you peace on earth and goodwill to man. What that means is he's come to give you his hand. He's come to help you. He sees you. He knows where you are, and he has peace for you. And this is good news. This is great news. He's come to help us. And in Matthew, 
in Matthew, I see in this verse, Matthew 11, I want to talk to you about this because this is really, if we could activate this scripture in our lives, it has the power to transform us, to revolutionize the way we operate, right? And so if we actually grabbed hold of this and we made it a daily practice of ours, I'm going to tell you, you didn't need to fear the next decade because you're going into it with power, with power. So let's look at that scripture. It says in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, It says, come to me, all of you who are tired and worn out from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you more work to do. (laughs) No, it didn't say that, did it? Although we act like that. We act like that. He says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke up and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble, and I will find peace. You'll find peace and rest for your soul. I love that. You find peace and rest for your soul. You know, have you ever wondered what this soul peace is he's talking about? See, it's much more than physical peace, right? We all need physical peace. I mean, physical rest. We all need that, right? But soul, soul peace is more than just resting. There's something else there that he's trying to get at, and we all need this soul rest. And so the problem that I see is not that we have overloaded muscles, Matter of fact, some of you need to uh, exercise our muscles more, right? You see, it's not overloaded muscles that, that stress us out. It's not. It's overloaded minds and overloaded hearts that are full of anxiety and tension, right? The tiredness that we feel, it's emotional. It's spiritual. It's not so much physical, and I'm going to tell you, nothing can, can give you that soul peace and rest that you need. Nothing can give it to you. No amount of watching TV or trying to be entertained or taking pills or drinking, right? Or, or trying to work, being a workaholic. Nothing will answer that need inside, that craving for soul peace. And yet, God says at the deepest level that he's going to give, us to, give that to us if we turn and look at him. Because in this scripture I'm talking to you about, I see three things that if we will engage in each and every day, that we can walk, we can have this cadence of peace with Christ. And it's this, the first one, and you can circle it inside your scripture. The first one is, come to me. Circle that, come to me. Jesus is saying, come to me for peace. Don't go to pills or a program or a philosophy, but come to me because Jesus says he is the source of all peace. And so we need to come to him. And when I read scriptures, when I see that Jesus walked the earth, people came to him for all different things, for healings, to get answers to prayers, right? Uh, to questions they had or to, for eternal salvation. But did you realize that you could come to Jesus for peace? And the Holy Spirit says that the peace that you so need, you come to Jesus and you find it there. You come to Jesus and you find it there. Mm -hmm. Yes, Father, you find it there. The next thing I see in that scripture, the next thing I see is to take my yoke. Circle that, take my yoke. Jesus is talking about being yoked up with him, being connected with him. Now, we don't use a yoke So let me explain what a yoke is to you. A yoke is just a wooden little frame that they use for farm animals, and they put their heads in, and they will be able to pull together to accomplish whatever it is that they were were working towards, whether it was a plowing a field or whatever. And so they were yoked. So the purpose of a yoke is to make it easier on the animal. And so the yoke, the yoke for us is a symbol of our partnership. The yoke for us is a symbol of our partnership. It should be a metaphor for our life. It should be that we are pulling with Jesus. And you see you're getting stressed out or you have anxiety or you have worry. Why? Because you're not yoked up with Jesus. You're you're working out of a philosophy that says, if it's to be, it's all up to me. And Jesus is challenging that because that's not working too well for you. And he says, no, slip your head. Choose to slip your head. And walk with me, and together we'll plow this ground. Thank you, Father. And then I see this last part where he says, tell me, let me teach you. So circle that. It says, let me teach you. Jesus says to us that he wants us to come under him. He wants to teach us how to walk in the real rhythm of life where your life can produce this peace. He wants us to walk with him. And then when he's talking to us, he tells us that there's this 
Yep, okay. So let me slow down here because I feel like today, just this moment, that God is calling to you. He's calling to you. He's using my words, but he's calling to you. That there are many of you, he says to you, come to me. He won't let me off of this. He says, tell them to come to me. Not to, not to anybody else, just come to me and to yoke up with me. And I call them, Sharon, and I call them and remind them that I am gentle and I am humble. And so Christ is saying, come and sit under him, for he is gentle and he is humble. And when I look at the gentleness and I look in the humbleness, I think to myself, hmm, if I were to write that scripture, I probably would say, come, so that you can have more endurance and stamina to do the work. <laughs> But that's not what Jesus says. He says to come to him because he wants to, he wants to use these two things, gentle and humbleness. Now don't miss this because they are two antidotes to the biggest giants that bring us stress. What are those biggest giants, Sharon? They're arrogance, which is pride, and they are also aggression, which is control. And those two, they, they, they fuel us. They fuel us. And so the arrogance says, I can do it on my own. I can do this. I got this. I don't need to bother God, right? And when we find ourselves getting stressed and we can't do it, we say, it's okay, I'll just, I want this. I'll just put it on the credit card even though I can't afford it, right? And arrogance says, I'm just going to, I'm just going to buy it. I'm just going to buy it with money I don't have, right? And the thing I don't need to impress people I don't even like. <laughs> that's, that's pride. And arrogance is, I will control this, Right? And it's this thing that's down inside that's a force that pushes God out of the way and says, I'll do it on my own because after all, I know what's best. You see, God is God. You are not. Jesus understood that about us. I wonder if we understand that about us. I wonder if when I'm saying that, you're justifying, well, that's not me. I'm here to tell you that's me. That's me. I need his humbleness and I need his gentleness just as much as you do, right? I need it because I know that my ego and, and, you know, my pride can get up and get in the way of what God wants to do in my life, just like yours. And so he gives us this antidote. This antidote is gentleness and humbleness, and that's where he comes and he partners alongside us, and, and it just dissipates all the stress, all the worry, all the anxiety. You see that? And then in Isaiah 26, 3, the last scripture, it says, You, Lord, give true peace to those who depend on you because they trust in you. So, friends, if we take that scripture and we want to make an impact this Christmas, we really want to understand the gift that our baby Jesus brought in, which he ushered in the peace, then where will you get your peace? You know, where will you get your joy? And today I've talked to you about this. I've talked to you about how Jesus brings you that peace, the peace with God, the peace within ourselves, and the peace of working with other people, relational peace. I've talked to you about, you know, relying on him to give you this moment of clarity and coming humbly before your God, knowing that he is God and you are not right? And then I talk to you about, if you look at the scriptures, if you spend time with them, how they have all the answers that you need in your heart. All you have to do is spend the energy and the time to look and to come, to choose to come to Jesus. And so my, my prayer for you and why I got out of bed, even though I didn't feel good today, is because I had to. I have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you see, God says that he doesn't want his people to go one more, one more day, one more breath without being able to embrace the true gift that he sent at Christmas, which is the peace that can reside in all men because he's here to help you. Bow your heads with me. Thank you, Father. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit's presence in this room. And Father God, I ask again that each and every person that you brought in here that you were speaking to, that you would, yep, help them, Father, now to move. Help them to have ears to hear what your Spirit was saying. Help them to move, Father, upon what it is that you've dropped into their heart. And so, Father, those of you in here, Father says start there that don't know Jesus 
as your Savior. They're far from God. That you know there's a distance. Well, God says that he doesn't want that distance. It's not why he, he has you here today. He wants to bring you home. He wants you to come home for Christmas. And so if that's you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. While everybody is, is eyes are bowed, they are listening for the Holy Spirit to speak to them. I'm specifically talking to those of you that are far from God right now. You know, it's one thing to know about the message of Jesus Christ. It's a whole other thing to, to accept it personally. And when you pray, that's what happens. And so right where you're at, you can just say, Father God, I accept your son, Jesus Christ, and I ask for forgiveness of my sins. Yes. And Jesus, the best way I know how, I ask you to be the leader of my life. Now, Father, those that were praying that prayer, I thank you that you sealed it in their heart and that you've written their name in the book of life. Father says it's not anything you have to do. You just have to acknowledge it, and he takes over. So, Father, I thank you for that. In spirit, I ask that you would also move upon us. There are so many of us. You showed me this all week long. There's so many of us that we don't have the peace of God inside of us, that we don't have the peace of God, that we wrestle and we wrestle. And so, Lord, I ask the best way I know how now. I bind the enemy's lies in the name of Jesus Christ, and I release those 790 promises to move throughout this room, Lord, that they would explode with power and might as people come upon them in your word. And for the first time, the lights will go on. It will be an aha moment for them, Father. And I lift them up to you now in the name of Jesus. Make your people a whole people, Lord. Lord, I see that. Make them, Lord, a courageous people, people that would lean into you, that would walk. And I would be able to see, Father, that the cadence of their life produces great peace. And Father, you say to us that if your people called by your name would humble themselves and come before you, that you would heal our land. And so, Father, I thank you that you start right in the pews. You start right in the chairs, Lord, with us. And so, Father, I ask that you would move upon each person here and that you would begin them to see them arise, Lord God, not with issues of, of being right or wrong, but with the love of Christ, that they would go into the cities, Father, that they would go into the highways and the byways and that they would make a difference, Lord, by their compassion and their love for one another, Lord God, that they would lift you up, that you would make us, Father, like a city planted on a hill that would be able to shine out for all men to come, that you have this voice that says that you have brought peace and that we are the peacemakers, that we walk in peace. This is only something you can do, Lord. Bring that relational peace. Bring that peace to all men, Father. I thank you for that, Lord. And I give you all these words that were spoken and all these prayers that were prayed. And, oh, Father, take them. And let your life be glorified, Lord, and let us accomplish all that you've asked us to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, guys, now we're getting ready to transition. And so the ushers are coming forward.